In this video, I'm going to continue on with the 2015 HSC. This is part three, and we're picking up at question 23B. We just finished talking a little bit about uh, fixed and mobile telephone systems. Something I didn't say that I just wanted to add on is the difference in that we have better quality signal and we have more bandwidth. So if we're sending things like the internet, we can send an image faster over land con landline connections typically, and um, we're going to have better sound quality typically over... Um, these things depend, obviously. Australia is the leader in Wi-Fi technology and uh, on 3G technology, so it's a little bit less of the case here. But what we're going to talk about now is the process of digitizing information. So we live in an analog world, things like heat, light, sound, these things are wave, wave flow, like water waves, they're all an analog signal. If we want to store things though, we typically these days want to store things as digital signals. Digital signals have a lot of advantages. First of all, it's a lot easier to transmit a digital signal. It's a lot easier to store a digital signal. It's also a lot easier to have automation work involved with digital signals. A computer can deal with digital signals more easily than analog signals. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to sample the signal at a regular time interval and then we're going to quantize the signal by assigning a set value. Now obviously there's a um, the greater the, the sampling rate, so the more often we sample, the better we're going to have, but there's also a quantizing rate. We might quantize, say for instance, temperature to the nearest degree, which is going to be less accurate than say graphing it um, to a, a higher degree, to, to 0.1 of a degree, for instance. That would be an effect of where the sampling rate and the quantizing accuracy are important. Okay, so I think that that's um, how a signal is digitized. Yeah, I, th I think I've answered that question well enough. Okay, a suitable method for protecting this steel column. Now, the reality is this steel column, I would say that if this is a train track, that they're usually hot tip galvanized. And what the hot tip galvanizing does is it has a um, oxide coating, a zinc oxide coating, which protects the outside structure. We can also paint steel structures. The um, painting is less good because if we get a scratch in the painting, we're going to have um, crevice corrosion. Uh, or, sorry, concentration cells. So is uh, the word I was looking for there. Sorry about that. Um, now, how does that protect? Well, by having a protective coating, what we're going to do is we're going to prevent contact with moisture. By preventing contact with moisture, we're going to uh, reduce galvanic attack. Okay, moving on to, it was saying that it's been rolled, right? So it would be what we'd expect. Steel beams are typically cold rolled <laughs> using 0.4% carbon. That seems like an appropriate carbon content. So what is the microstructure? Well, I'll show you the answer that they've given the book, which I don't think is great because that's a little too circular, but I guess it's a, a sign of how much you can get away with. Me, I would be drawing about 10 of these grains, and it's really important that you draw them elongated because it's been rolled, because it, cold rolled, yeah, it should be, because they've been elongated. Okay, yep. Could you elongate them? Yeah, you could. You, you could draw them vertically instead of or in any direction you wanted. So elongated grains, it's important that you label. So there's for two marks, it's also really important that you provide appropriate labels. That's something that a lot of people don't include. They don't include the labels. How much of it is perlite? About 50% is perlite, right? So 100% perlite would be 0.8%. So at 0.4, we're about half perlite. So the other half is ferrite, perlite. Okay, so... And the next question is a truss. Now, I'm not going to go through the details of this because we've already done this on the board, but the very, very quick version is that we have to determine the reaction at A. So to do that, we'll take moments about B. We only have three forces. We have the 200 Newton, sorry, the 1200 Newtons times 1.5 uh, plus, because we're, they're going uh, clockwise, plus 750 times 4.5 minus 1.5 times reaction A. We put plug that into the calculator and we'll get A. To find B, what we'll do is we'll say, which is the next question, to find B, it says we'll do that by finding the sum of the horizontal and vertical forces. Once we've found reaction B horizontal, reaction B horizontal, we can then combine those together using Pythagoras' theorem. And then once we have Pythag that value, we can then find the angle using the arc tan or the inverse tan function. Um, to to find the angle. Okay, to find the uh, member at AC, what I would suggest you want to do is you want to cut through the section from BC to AF. That's how we find AC. And when we do that, we're going to cut and expose three members. So we don't worry about CF, C, uh, uh, FD because they're internal members. The only we are only concerned with cut members: BC, AC, and AF. 
Now, we're finding AC, so it means we have to eliminate BC and eliminate AF. To do that, we need to find where these lines meet. Do they meet? Well, they're not parallel, so it means that they meet somewhere. Where do they meet? Well, they both meet at point E. So if we take moments about point E, we'll have... Um, we can eliminate this force, the 750, because its perpendicular distance to E will be zero. So we'll only have two forces that are not perpendicular distance to zero, and that's going to be AC and the 1200. So we're going to have 1200 times three, and then we're going to have AC times its perpendicular distance. Now, its perpendicular distance is a bit funny. Its perpendicular distance is going to be, this, this distance here is three meters. So its perpendicular distance is sort of this line here. That's its perpendicular distance. That's where, if we extended this line out, that's where its perpendicular distance would be. So we're going to take three sine 45, which gives us uh, 2.12 meters or something like that. That's one way of doing it. I've also gone through a second method, which is what we can do is we can find, we can split AC into a horizontal and vertical component. And the horizontal component will be zero, or we multiply by zero because the horizontal component, its perpendicular distance to E will be zero. So we just ignore that. Once we have AC in the vertical component of AC, we can then just multiply it by, um, uh, we can just find the, the angle using trigonometry. So we multiply, we divide by uh, sine 45, um, and that will give us our, um, our value. Okay, I've gone through that on the board already. Um, maybe one day I might slice that into a video, or, but probably not. Okay, the two images show light aircraft powered by different propulsion systems. Identify a suitable one. Okay, well, this is a business aircraft. It's typically jet aircraft. Um, we're going to go with uh, a turboprop or, um, because turbofans are typically only in very large commercial aircraft and recreational aircraft is usually piston powered. Why would we use both? Well, we would use uh, identify suitable um, and justify it. So we'd say business aircraft typically use turboprops because they're more efficient while recreational aircraft use piston engines because they're easier to maintain. That would be a sufficient answer. Okay. Um, Outline two control adjustments that can be made to vary lift while uh, uh, entering a flight. Okay, so we discussed this in class, but the main thing we do to affect lift is by adjusting the elevators, which help us to adjust uh, pitch. Something else that allows us to increase our lift is by increasing thrust. The more thrust we have, the more lift we get. Um, there are other things that we can also change the wing dimensions through things like slats and flaps and they will both allow us to increase our angle of attack without having, um, without causing wing stalling. Okay, so there's an aerofoil, so we're going to do a lift drag thrust question. Um, so because it's climbing, I haven't drawn this on the board, or at least not recently, so what we need to do first of all is we have uh, the resultant force is how much lift it's produced. So we're going to produce a, tri a triangle, and the triangle is always going to have the weight as vertical, because that's the definition of vertical, is the way that things fall when you drop them. So we're going to have the vertical weight going down, we're going to have our lift going up, and we're going to have our thrust thrust minus drag at the angle of attack, which is 10 degrees. So, or 10 degrees for this angle. So if we know that we're getting 350 on our, let's call it our adjacent angle, and we want to find our drag, the lift to drag ratio, um, yeah, look, I'm going to have to go through this question in more detail with a, with, with a marker. Um, it's too hard for me to, to do the calculations without um, going through it. Okay, Al ultrasonic set testing. What's its advantage in using electrical air aircraft? Well, it's non-destructive. So I could say, my answer might say something like, ultrasonic testing is a non-destructive method of finding cracks in, um, or subsurface cracks or surface cracks in aircraft. The advantage is that it can detect cracks below the surface and it's non-destructive, so it allows, uh, and it doesn't require us to remove pieces. To, it can be done um, on site. That would be, I think, a sufficient answer for four questions and four marks. We're talking about how it's non-destructive, subsurface cracks can be done on site, um, and if you said maybe it's fast and efficient, something like that. Affordable. Oh, and uh, what's the advantage? Well, so by detecting these cracks, um, uh, detecting these cracks early, it can improve safety. Okay, moving on to, okay, we've got a question here. So this is what I call a boat question. When we do these questions, I probably won't go through this without, we'll have to do this on the board, so I won't go through it in a lot of detail here. 
But typically when we want to find the tension in a cable, we use the formula which is T equals mg sine mu. Um, sorry, I said the wrong Greek letter there. T equals mg sine theta plus or minus mg mu cos theta. I remember it as the mucus formula, but if you remember that formula, you can probably apply it and you get an answer that sounds pretty reasonable. It's always important to remember, is friction helping you or hurting you? The, whether or not you do the plus or minus is depending on whether or not friction is. Is, fr is friction stopping the thing from rolling up, uh, 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 being pulled up the hill, or is it stopping it from fall rolling down the hill? You just got to think about which way friction is it helping you or hindering you, and that's whether you use plus or minus. Or something we'll go into in more detail in class. Um, okay, we went through this one recently. So in this question here, we're to find the velocity ratio of this uh, this example. We have two different uh, di we were given a diameter and a radius. So I don't care if you use the radius or the diameter. The answers in the uh, from the HSC use the radius, which makes a lot of sense because they're talking about moments and the moment arm is perpendicular distance. That's fine. In which case, this will be nine ten times point. Um, they used meters. Right, so for consistency, doesn't matter if you use meters or millimeters. For the sake of argument, we'll use millimeters. So it'll be 9, 10 times 50 divided by 350 gives us F. Pretty easy for, uh, oh wait, and then we have to apply the, it's 85% efficient, which means that we, we want the force. So 85% efficiency, if it's only 85% efficiency, that means we need to put more effort into it. So that means we divide by 0.85, not multiply by 0.85. We want a bigger number, not a smaller number, because it's inefficient. Okay, moving on. This is a good question. Okay, what are the significance of these points? So, why is the elastic limit or the proportional limit? In this case, it's the same thing. Uh, people can. Def I have once talked about the very minor difference between elastic limit and proportional limit. Effectively, we can consider them the same. This is the upper yield point, the lower yield point. Typically, we often say that the elastic limit, we will use the yield point because it's a lot easier to measure. If it doesn't have a, yield, a definite yield point, it's called progressive, and we worry about using Proust stress. So we'd use the point two, uh, point, uh, sorry, that's percentage extension, that's 1%. We'd use 0.2%, um, so like that line there. Anyway, this is why is the UTS, the upper, te um, upper, upper tensile strength, uh, sorry, I apologize. Um, UTS is the ultimate tensile strength. Um, now, that's not all that useful. We're far more interested in the yield, the lower yield strength, or the elastic limits, far more useful for us than the uh, ultimate tensile strength. But important to know, nevertheless, Z is the breaking point. Um, anything past here we consider to be necking. When it fails, it fails with a cup and cone failure, which means that one side is slightly extended or, or um, concave, and one side is slightly uh, convex. Okay, so this is an E equals flea question. So we're finding the mod Young's modulus, E, capital E, equals F, which is, what is our force? Using the data from the stress strain graph. Okay, so for a stress strain graph, so we're going to use our force is going to be, what's that, 19? So one. No, 18. So we're going to use 18 kilonewtons, and our extension is 0.5 millimeters. So if we plug in, so it's F, which is 18 kilonewtons, so 18,000 times L, which is 55 millimeters, divided by E, which is 0 0.05 millimeters times 9.6 millimeters squared. We're happy with that because all of our units were in millimeters. So that means our answer is going to be in megapascals. We want an answer in gigapascals, so we divide by 1,000, right? Because answers are typically given in gigapascals. Good question. Okay. Uh, an engineer uh, consists of a team, an electrical engineer uh, and environmental engineer. They've been conducted by a local council. Outline how each of these engineers would contribute to a successful completion of a project. Okay, pretty long. This is eight marks, so it's pretty long. I, very, 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 very quickly. So the civil engineer will under, will coordinate things like the geotechnical uh, properties of the ground. They'll understand the materials of the concrete and steel that they use. The electrical engineer will understand things like the power supply. Uh, what's it for? Mm, 
pedestrian bridge. Okay, so electrical engineer probably organize things like how we're going to interact with the car, the power on the road, so and how to do that safely. The environmental engineer will ensure that we do this safely without in negatively impacting on other.